Okay, welcome everyone. This is Michael Gibbs. How are you all today? I am really excited today. I am here with my really good friend, Andrea Ikaza. Andrea is someone I know now for over 20 years. Andrea is one of those people that if there's a bomb that hits and you have 10 people to bring with you that you want to know that you can count on, Andrea is one of those people. So I'm really, really excited to have Andrea here today. I'll give you a little bit about Andrea's background and why I brought her here, and then I'll let Andrea actually introduce herself to you. I have known Andrea for 20 some years. I see, I've seen her direct a team of systems engineers. I've seen her run a large TAC. I've seen her run projects that are so big and so complex doing things that no one's ever done before and still do it successfully. And I've seen her do customer success. In fact, I met Andrea about 20 some years ago. We were working at a company called Riverstone Networks, which as far as I can tell, was one of the best and most fun tech companies in the world. We did all kinds of things. We were partial creators of the VPLS, you know, that first cloud 20 some years ago, basically bridging layer two traffic over MPLS. That was her cloud experience over 20 years ago, as well as some of mine. She, she used to call me three times a day. She ran a team of systems engineers and they were all doing IP multicast. And in those days, I was the principal consulting multicast architect. So pretty much she had a project with her team. That meant I was on it. <laughs> she ran the TAC. If there was something that didn't work with regards to multicast, because we were doing video over DSL and all kinds of technologies that weren't ready for prime time, but super excited, it would be Andrea that would be calling me. And I got to work with her and her team. And let me tell you, it is an exceptionally, it was an exceptionally good experience. And I'm thrilled to call her a friend. And it's someone I have the biggest trust in in the world. So I brought her here today to talk about global program management. See, a lot of you guys come to me for architecture. We're building your tech careers. And, you know, I love that. But, you know, we architects design things. And after we're done designing them, there's a team of engineers that have to go build it. And there's so many things that need to be done. There's so much to be able to manage people that don't work for you, be able to get the resources from people that don't work for you, getting people to do their jobs when you can't fire them because they don't work for you, <laughs> being able to satisfy a customer. And Andrea is good at it all. And because of that, and because architects have to have some program management skills, because on small projects, we maybe do it ourselves. And on those $100 million or $1 billion projects, it's going to be someone like Andrea that actually leads it. So there's lots of communication skills, lots of executive presence, requirements for integrity and relationship development. And that's one of the reasons I am so lucky to have Andrea here and call her a friend. So we all know me. I'm a cloud architect. We all know me. I'm a network architect, a security architect, and the CEO of Go Cloud Architects. And... I'd like to turn this over to you, Andrea, to have you introduce yourself the way you see yourself as opposed to the way I see you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. Um, I'd like to take credit for all those wonderful things. Um, so uh, I have been working in the industry and um, for a number of years. I don't like to get into the numbers, but um, Mike has been one of those special resources, I'm sure you all know, uh, that when he knows it, he's going to go above and beyond and make sure that the thing is successful that you're working on. So it, it's a really good lead in to one of the key principles, the key characteristics of what you need in uh, customer success, a program management or any job, I would say, knowing who your resources are, knowing where the good people are. It's so important. And uh, being humble enough to know, you know, uh, for someone like me, I'm not hands-on technical, but I I know when I know how people respond to the people who are good, right? So my team is going to respond the way they responded to Mike was, oh my gosh, that was so good, that was so helpful immediately. And Mike saw this problem. Customers mentioned his name, so right away you start. Okay, I've got several data points telling me Mike Gibbs has got the answers for this. I need to make him happy and engage him as often as I can without burning him out, right? So it's a key principle of uh, building a strong team, especially one where Mike didn't work for me, um, but I worked with him and, and tried to get his expertise as much as possible on the projects I'm working on. So anyways, it's nice to be with you all. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction, Mike. And thank you as well. So, you know, that's something really important. If we're architects, if we're program managers, we have to build a team. You know, my architecture world, you know what I know? I know networking real well. 
Specifically, I know BGP and I know IP multicast and designing systems for healthcare. But even when I design systems for healthcare, I might be Mr. BGP or Mr. IP multicast, but you know what I'm not? I'm not Mr. Database and that's okay. I'm not a coder, no way. Um, to me, that's like a medieval torture for me, but for other people, it's the best thing in the world. And I love that. That's why the world needs more people. So because we need great coders, because we need great program managers, because we need engineers and architects that have skills that are different than ours, that's knowing who your resources are and who is willing to work for you and who has the honesty and integrity to give you real information and who gets the job done. At least for me as an architect, I'd say that was the key to my success. How about yourself, Andrew? Yeah, I think I think that's true. Um, when you're, let's see, uh, you may have all heard of a racy matrix where there's responsibility, authority. Um, what is the third one? Uh, but there's influencer, um, and I think communication. Anyways, everyone plays a different role within a project using a racy matrix. Oftentimes we'll have the responsibility, let's say as an architect or a program manager or customer success, we'll have the responsibility to make the project successful or the deployment successful, but not necessarily the authority. So how do you do that is really challenging. And, and uh, that's, um, it, it's actually, I would probably say it's not as challenging as I would have thought. I used to feel I need everyone that's gonna work on this to work for me, right? <laughs> But you know, early on, uh, you start seeing that people are motivated by many things. And part of that is uh, being successful at their job, being part of a, an exciting project, um, being part of something that's new. People are motivated on those topics much more than who they report to, right? And they don't go home at the end of the day and say, well, I, I did my status report and that was all I had to do and I did what my boss wanted. No, they want to have a fulfilling, challenging career. Um, what I have said often, and, and even when uh, I've looked at different jobs, is I want, for me, and everyone needs to make this decision and choice, but I know when I work at a company, I want to be as close to revenue without being a salesperson myself as I can. The company cares about revenue. So therefore, that's where their resources and that's where their priorities are going to line up. So I say, put me as close to revenue as possible, but I don't want to be on commission. So I find that global program management being, which is a lot of times part of a, in larger companies, it's called sales enablement uh, or customer success. These are all synonyms and whatever uh, hot word is for the day, but leading projects for customers or on behalf of customers is really important and being close as you guys are all studying, a lot of you to be, uh, being an architect is being very, very close to revenue. So it's very key because when you bring up an issue, you're going to have the company behind you, the resources behind you, because it's important to the company leaders. It's close to revenue. It's a customer you're working with. And that's why you'll get a team of both direct employees and indirect. They're motivated to help you. Now that, that sentence, sentence, the closer to revenue, that is really, really important. So when people ask me, should I choose engineering or architecture? I ask a lot of questions. One, some people love being engineers. They love being hands-on on the computer. That is the perfect engineer. Even still, I like to tell the engineers, if you're on the sales side of it, you know, when there's a layoff, you're bringing in money, you don't get laid off. If you're a corporate resource and you're a back, you're an expense. Now, don't think that any of these companies can survive without those critical backend resources because they can't. They're critical, critical, critical people. But, you know, it's that person that's closer to sales. What happens when you're closer to sales? Well, you get paid more because they associate you with the dollars. So you earn more because you're closer to the customer. Also, because you're closer to the customer, you're the source of the money coming in, which is why you're treasured. So in this, it works in all industries. When doctors admit their patients to the hospital, guess what? We're revenue sources for the hospitals. They love it. And nurses who take care of the patients 24 by 7, well, we're only there for 15 minutes, they're an expense. So if a doctor walks into a hospital and is mean to the nurse, they, the, and the nurse goes to a management, they're like, look, you know, they bring us patients who cost us money. So be close to revenue. I don't care what industry you are, it is the best place to be. But really what she said, people are motivated by being successful. So 
when we start going through these jobs, different things are going to be related to being successful. When you want to have people work for you that don't work for you, you know, now we're talking about, you know, the executive presence to walk in the room and command the room that people trust you. Now we're talking about leadership skills. Now we're talking about empathy, the ability to look into people's lives and find the challenges they actually have and help them get through their challenges. Now we're talking about emotional intelligence, being with a person that's struggling and finding a way to get to them. Now we're talking about finding people's goals and helping them get there. Okay, you're helping me with this project. You don't work for me. Where do you want to be a year from now? How can I get you there? At least in my world as an architect, these are critical skills. And you know, I'm assuming in program management and customer success, they're pretty critical too. Yes, yes, very much. Yes, right on. Um, I, I think in our uh, an architect's job and um, customer success, program management. I mean, we're all customer facing and trying to understand the needs of the customer and providing technical solutions. So. One may be more hands-on and more technical, but we're all trying to get to the same goal. And it's one of the main things um, that we do in a more of a customer-facing role, again, I'm speaking about not necessarily a back-end engineer, is gathering your customer needs. And, you know, then the whole saying of, you know, we've got two ears, right? One mouth. So many calls I've been on, uh, everyone just wants to show you know, well, I know we can do this, we can do this, we can do that, you know, and everyone can talk a lot about, you know, 25 different buzzwords in one sentence. It's just overkill, right? So it's really key to listen and they will tell you what they need if you're listening and if you ask the right questions. So they're not going to get on the phone with you or have a meeting with you unless they made that decision already. Now it's your job to make the most of it and to ask good questions. Talk to them like a human, you know, don't come across as an Android or a, <laughs> shouldn't say Android, you know what I mean, a, a robot. It's great. And uh, really get to know them. And and you don't want to come off with your, what are your uh, technical challenges today? You know, you don't want to come off like you're reading a list of questions, but really, um, and Mike, I know you've talked about this in some of your other videos where you mirror the customer's tone and uh, we run into that. We all run into that several times and the kind of things that happen when you don't uh, do that. Let's say you're in a meeting and the customer saying, well, I really need help getting this design finalized by the end of next week. And in your head, you're doing, th there, that's not possible, right? We have too many things to do. I have 10 meetings lined up. That's not going to happen. So you really don't address it, right? So you ignore it and you're thinking, you know, I'll, I'll get to that later. Well, guess what? In the back, I'm just saying what could happen when we don't listen to those strong signals. They're gonna, they may call someone else. They may email someone else in your organization or somebody else and say, uh, yes, I tried to reach out to them, but they weren't available. This is what I need. Can you help me? And you know how much it takes to say, yes, I can help you. It doesn't take anything. So just say, yes, yes, I can do that. Yes, I agree. That's what you need. And I'm going to work with you to get that done. Doing. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. So yes, it's it's so important because especially in a big customer, sometimes a very large global environment, you'll have many, many people, let's say in a Zoom meeting or wanting to give their two cents. Well, I know a certain way and you kind of got to wait till hear everyone say their point of view. And I've been on calls where our CEO or someone will call and say, let's just let them talk. Just let let's hear what the customer says. We know what we think, right? Mm -hmm. You're in a company. We already know, oh, our solution ABC will do this. But let's hear the customer's actual need and then be able to meet it because anyone can just kind of skim the skim the top end of the, a message and, and then uh, address it. But we, um, we need to learn to know when not to talk. Good point. Alexandra, beautiful name. So anyways. So going back to it, I know Jesse loved it, and I know I love it. Two ears, one mouth. I tell my students the secret to success is to listen a lot more than you speak. It's to ask the open-ended questions to get people talking, and then just listen. And obviously, when you hear something, I tell my students to repeat it back to make sure you have it. Because yeah. that, tells my that tells the person on the receiving end, yes, you heard them. But it also eliminates mistakes. 
because what we hear or we think we hear versus what they actually want aren't always the same. And you know, in the military, they they you know, they they say rendezvous in three mics or three minutes at X Y Z location. Guess what? You confirm. I got it. Roger that rendezvous six mi three mics whatever location. And they're doing that to make sure mistakes don't happen. In medicine, we do it. In medicine, I ask questions. You know what? I just listen. I basically ask a question. I listen for five minutes, assuming I have the time. I ask another question. I listen for five minutes. They will tell me if I'm listening. But yes. if I'm talking, I'm not getting anything. That's right. That's true. Yes. It's so it's so important. And the repeating back is also very important. And I would emphasize not just externally with your customers, because they're not always going to want to read a recap, right, of what we just meant about, but maybe a very small one. But even internally, such key decision, everyone is so busy, right, and overloaded. So when you're working at a company, as you all probably can relate to, everyone is full of data points. Okay, I need this by Thursday, that code, this, this feature request, this, whatever it may be. Everyone has a list of deliverables. So they don't, um, we need, and oftentimes we agree on things, but did you, who remembers what they agreed? What, you know, while they've had discussion, then they may have had 10 other discussions, which then moved your priority down. So even uh, sometimes we do that and we're quite formal, right? And, and more polite, I would say, with our customers but we need to show that same politeness and respect to our internal employees who don't work for us, by the way, that we need their help and they, we, we need their expertise. And without them, there is no product to say, thank you for your time, for our discussion. I'm going to go ahead and tell the customer we can provide this by X and X date. And then you really, they see it in black and white, give them a chance to say yes, or mm, I may have to shift that. And that respect for your internal colleagues is, is so important in what we talked about before in enlisting people who don't work for you to want to help and to help, want to help work with you and building that charitable goodwill that uh, maybe, you know, we let's just take back 20 years ago and Mike would help solve this incredibly difficult problem. We were made sure to say, oh my, you know, not because we had to, but to express how much we appreciated Mike and the value he brought to a particular deal that we want to deal because of its expertise. Now, maybe next time we ask him, he's going to say, hey, they don't take me for granted, right? So he may be more willing to help us versus someone else who's just, you know, not, maybe not aware of how much time it takes to help someone. And what were you flying all across the world for us? <laughs> so, I did. And, you know, there's the other side of that coin. So it's the, it's the respect and the trust that you get from the person on the other side, but it's one other factor. I basically, you know, I was an architect. So, you know, here I am, you know, designing systems, presenting them and selling them. And as it turned out, I happened to have some really strong engineering background in multicast. So while I was an architect, I ended up doing a little bit of engineering to help the company out. So here's what I will say. I was everywhere. I mean, and the kind of places that I went, you know, it had been one point um, there when I just joined, there had been a massive layoff and some people had bought some products that weren't working. And my manager, Joe, who was a great guy from the Marine Corps and Andrea, who ran a different side, they're like, Mike, can you go fix this stuff? And I did. And I went to one place. It was great. The next place, it was great. The next place, it was great. The next place, somebody picked up a shotgun and pointed it at me. And I remember calling Andrea saying, Andrea, just to let you know, I'm going to leave. By the way, <laughs> Could you call my manager and tell him I'm leaving and I'll call him after you speak to him. So <laughs> my manager was like an E7 in the Marine Corps. He was a really, really good guy. And I like him a lot. He's a friend. I trust him a lot. I won't say anything but great things about my manager. He's, he still is a good guy. Yes. <laughs> He's still a good guy. But, you know, he wasn't known to be soft. He just left his 12-year stint in the Marine Corps. So I trusted that Andrew would call my manager and say, you know, Mike just left. Um, apparently, you know, a shotgun was pointed at him. He doesn't love guns pointed at him. He's not strange to this because it happened a lot when he was a paramedic. He's a martial arts guy. But, you know, Mike left. So Mike will give you a call when he feels ready because um, it's my customer. He let me know first. And just take it easy on Mike. Having that air cover, knowing I had someone that would support me no matter how bad things were, enabled me to basically say, wow, I trust this person. They're honest. They have integrity. Guess what? If they put me in a bad position, I'm not afraid because I know they're there for me. 
So when I got sent to parts of the world that, you know, people would be afraid to go to, where I actually had a great time, but it was like, okay, I know I'm jumping on this plane. If something bad happens, there's someone that's going to get me out of here. And that is really critical. Yes, that's so true. And I think we can all relate to that with COVID, right? I mean, we I talked to colleagues in India and their family was, you know, in dire straits. And, you know, they were there's one person we were scheduling a meeting and they said, well, I'm feeling, you know, I'm getting the chills. I have a fever. I mean, all the signs of COVID. And this was, I think, in yeah, early this year. But I'm going to come in and make that meeting that, that you requested with this customer because it's an important customer. And it's like, no, 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 no. Though I, you know, they knew that was better. But making sure we respect the person and their contributions, but the person as a whole. I mean, Mike being at a place with a, a gun, <laughs> that's, you know, it's priority one. It's it's There's nothing else that matters. Your health comes into jeopardy. There's nothing else that matters. And everyone feels that way, but some people are not as probably well-versed maybe in, in showing it, that we care about people. Yes, trust, trust. First and foremost, you've got to trust that this person isn't going to say just, yeah, come in, to, come in and let's have that meeting. And uh, regardless, you may have COVID, but hey, let's give it a shot. <laughs> so we need to, to respect people. Trust, coordinator, coordination, and communication. Absolutely. That's so true. Yeah. Alonzo actually has got good, strong program management roles too, which oh. I'm going to get him involved in in a minute. Alonzo is also a good friend. He's also a fantastic cloud architect. So, wow. you know, it's kind of interesting. Here's the level of that trust. I remember I had interviewed with Cisco one day and then they said, hey, can you come back tomorrow and interview with these five people and deliver a presentation? And I left that interview. I went straight to the airport. I was on the way to Dubai. And I remember I get a call from Andrea. Mike, you're going to Cisco. Now, I just oh, yeah. finished that meeting an hour ago. <laughs> and I literally went straight from this interview to the airport. And I'm getting this phone call. And I remember thinking, um, and she's like, I heard you're going to Cisco. I'm like, Andrea, how'd you know? I haven't told anybody. I haven't even told my wife yet. <laughs> and she says, oh, wait, that's another Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking, I'm going to be on going to Dubai. It's going to be a $20,000 trip. The last thing I need is my manager to think that I'm not going to be there when I get back. You know, it's going to be a big expense <laughs> on my credit card. You know, what <laughs> happens if I'm over there and something goes wrong? Look, I had the best experiences of my life in Dubai. I was treated like royalty. I loved it. But, you know, I saw the great truth of everything, CNN, which made me think I was going to get stoned to death out there. Because, you know, you watch CNN and it made it look scary and dangerous. It was the best place I've ever been to. So that's neither here nor there. I'm just saying, you know, when you're going over to these places, you've got to have people you trust in the background. Anytime it's a long trip, I don't care if you go to the middle of the desert, you want to know that there's somebody there that's going to be there for you. You need yeah. that air cover. Yes. Establish a, a group, even if it's one person, one person, and then build it. Only those people you trust and can really talk with, you know, I, I think that's important to keep your sanity at any job to vent with if needed and just to to make sure that they've got your back. Right. That's all about that's what that's about. You know, we need someone that has your back when you're not there. So I think that's that's key for all of us. Good it is. It's just so essential. So I'm going to ask you the question. What is program management? OK, good question. So I would say, uh, and I should remind you, as I said at the beginning, it goes by a lot of names, right? Yes. Uh, there's project management, there's the PMP, there's um, project supervision, there's professional services project managers. And what I have done in my career has mainly been um, what I would classify as program management, where they're large initiatives, right? I'm not directing a task, so I'm not responsible. Okay, roll out this telecommunication server and make sure that the, all the steps are followed. So I'm not writing test plans and making sure they're followed. I do, however, establish goals uh, for whatever initiative I'm working on, identify the stakeholders, uh, identify the milestones, the schedule, my resources, my risks, and how I'm going to mitigate those risks. And then everyone's going to say that's an overused word, but it's very true relationship management. You know, who at that customer 
where can I get the, where can I develop and maintain a strong relationship? And, you know, sometimes the higher in the uh, uh, ladder you go, the better, because they have decision-making power. But I don't want to say that's the only, that's the only way it matters. Because you could have a good, basically just a great engineer, and that happens a lot where they have so much influence because everyone knows if they agree, then it's good. And so it, the title matters to some degree, and you'll see that a lot at companies, but it is very important to not just have the formal decision makers, but the informal decision makers, the thought leaders, right, at a company where, let's say, multicast for Mike, right? Maybe he wasn't the, t- the head of engineering multicast, but it was important in the field. If Mike agrees with that, probably the rest of the field is going to all you know, sales is going to agree with that because they know he's seen all of all of our customers. So program management is taking all of those goals, all of those milestones, and being ideally this not a single point of contact, but a central point of contact to manage that ecosystem, right? And then man- feed that back into your corporation where you work in a synthesized manner to give them. Uh, the customer needs. Here's the customer goals. Here's what they want to do. And not to inject your own personal opinions, right? But just the, just the facts, right? Just the facts, Jack. Whatever. <laughs> so just state it what it is. Don't add any opinion. And uh, something I need to be reminded of, make it short, right? So, you know, put, when you're doing emails, <laughs> make it short, put your summary at the top. This is what I have to do for myself because I can be quite quote, verbose, (laughs) thorough, but, you know, no one has time to read a ton of emails. So capturing that entire, managing that ecosystem of the face to the customer, knowing how to manage that, and then managing it back into your corporate environment, managing the resources that are assigned to that project. And like I say, I'm an obstacle remover, right? If it's an engineer or architect, someone who's truly very technical is working on the team, I don't want them doing administrative things. I say, let me know if you have any obstacles and I'll run with those, right? Let me clear those obstacles for you. Let me make it easier for you to help me. So I would say it's bundling all of that and making sure you're aligned again with what are the, you're gonna ask the customer what their goals are. And then we also need to check that with what are the goals of our company for this engagement? They're typically going to be whatever the customer says they are, right? So I don't think that's a big disconnect, but you do want to make sure that maybe we want them to test a certain code or feature or something like that. You do want to make sure that you're always keeping in mind and have top of mind those goals, those overarching goals that are the most important and stay close to the get, stay close to that and don't get lost in the details. You know, two things you brought up, actually three things that I want to point out. The first one is on the briefness of and the succinctness of your message. So I had an executive coach and my partner at work, her name was Frances, and I have the incredible respect for her. We worked together every day for years. She helped me get multiple promotions and a good close friend. Now she's doing a lot more executive coaching, but you know, we work together. And when I first gave my first speech, I had just finished my MBA program. I had gotten out of being an engineer and I was now an enterprise architect and I was all excited. I give a speech. I strung together a million and one buzzwords, <laughs> complicated language. And she calls me right after her and she says, Michael, she said, would you mind if I spend you a buck to help kind of guide your career? And I'm like, that would be the nicest thing in the world. Tell me. She's like, I'm even going to buy it for you. So the first book shows up and it's why business people speak like idiots. And the second book is actually about how to write more succinctly. So two things make your communication plain. You know, we, I was just doing this with my students. We were teaching how to write for succinctness. Keep your sentences less than 11 words when you can, you know, like the New York Times, not that it's my newspaper, but it's written in a sixth grade level. Even The Economist, which I do enjoy reading, is written in an eighth grade level. The Wall Street Journal, which I like, is written at like a seventh grade level. So this is done for a reason. It's the way people like to consume information. So making it succinct. Andrew mentioned one other critical point, making sure that customers' priorities never lose focus. That is so essential. And the other piece is the pieces and parts. So I got to tell you, as an architect, and you know, I'm going to ask Andrew what her architects do at her company in a minute, but for me, really what it was, was 
going to that client and really getting that business. What are you want to do? What business goals do you have? What business challenges do you have? What are your financial metrics? What are your competitors doing? That was my world. I did all of that. And then I'd go back and I'd do a design and I'd go find all those really smart engineers that knew all those engineering things to help me with the architecture. And then I'd go back to the customer and I'd go sell it. And then would it be built? Along with the program manager, I'd be the guy buying lunch, the guy buying drinks, the guy doing psychotherapy because you know, <laughs> the engineers weren't always treated as well as they could be. So I was the guy keeping them happy. I was the guy that would go to their managers and get them vacation time when they needed it. I was the guy buying dinners. You know, that's what I did as an architect. And I'm assuming you do a lot of that as a program manager, too. Yeah. Yeah, you do a lot of that. I mean, it, it, it varies by company. Um, so... That is essentially what uh, I. That's essentially what you know. We're a lot of us are doing. I am not sitting down, right? So I think of an architect of saying, "Give me, you know, let's discuss your business problems." And I know, and the architect would know our portfolio strong enough to to write out this yeah. is how we can solve it for you. Now I rely on an architect. You know, I can say it at a high level, but I rely on an architect to make sure it's correct, right? So, um, because those designs are so important as, as we recently said, we're working with a company and uh, we're at that design stage, right? And we have a design, but there's a couple questions here or there, you know, where should this traffic go? What about this policy? We wanna have an, a, another design review to make sure because they're gonna be living with that and we're gonna be living with that for the next 10 years, you know, plus. So it's an, a very important decision point, you know. So, yes, making sure that um, the team is happy, that the, that the team is um, motivated, those are all super important. And to one degree or another, maybe other departments or management is or is not taking care of those needs. At our company, I think they're pretty they're pretty good, right? Their 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 personnel, let's say. Um, issues or personnel type things are all handled quite well. They're well paid. I mean, they're, they're enough paid. They're motivated. They have time off. They have the time off when they need it, let's say. And uh, what really needs is how to get priority. So a lot of times I will say, we need to sell our projects internally, right? So we all, let's say, have this project. So I need a final design review. So, you know, may, maybe Mike just completed an architecture review or take someone, um, you know, out of my current environment, we do a design review and we're saying, you know what, they have some outstanding questions. How do I get time on someone's calendar that I know is scarce, right? It's very important. How do I prioritize my project? So there is internal selling. So this is something I say that's quite important, I'd say for all of us to do is to remember what value the project is to the company when you're trying to get people again to work on your project is, I'm working on this XYZ project. It's bringing in this many million dollars per quarter. We're finalizing our design after this. It's going to be locked down. Do you have some time tomorrow? You know, these people are available at this time. Make it as easy and attractive to other people to want to help you on your project because you want to get those decisions and that design locked down. I mean, it's not a written in stone, right? We all know that, but <laughs> adjustments will be made. But as as ideal as possible. And for that, you do need to sometimes remind people like in the company um, where their time is very limited. Here's why this project is important. Here's why it's worth your time to take this meeting. So I think that's important in all we do. Not that you need to continue to sound like a salesperson to everyone in your, you know, we're all the same company, but you know, it's kind of reminding them the importance of your project. You know, you touched on another point. For the architects like me, sales skills are critical. But I would say for technology professionals in general or anybody, sales skills are critical because you got to get people to want to do it. I remember the Tom Sawyer movie that I watched when I was younger because I wouldn't read. I read like two nonfiction books a week, but I've never read a novel in my life. I managed <laughs> to watch the movies in high school because I just I don't read nonfiction, but I read a couple books a week for knowledge. And in Tom Sawyer, when I think it was the book Tom Sawyer, he has his friends come over to go paint the fence. I think they called it whitewashing. And they're all painting the fence white. And he convinces all his friends it's going to be a fun party day and they'll do it together. Right. That's part of the job. Yes. So somebody asked, and I, I, I get this question every day. It's the most 
crazy question. I see, but somebody asked it, so I'm going to bring it up. The world has now convinced people with these stupid job descriptions, because you know how there's great inflation, like everybody now gets an A in school, and the people that work at Subway are now called sandwich architects. And now all these people are thinking that they're program you need to be a programmer to be an architect, that you're going to be coding things, and you're going to be behind a computer coding things all day long. What do the architects do at your company? Uh, the architects, well, um, they work with customers, just basically what we just discussed. They they work with our key customers, you know, which are like Fortune 100, Fortune 10 companies, right. getting down to their business needs. They have a solid understanding, not just um, high level understanding of our entire portfolio. So they're go going to be able to listen um, exactly what the business needs are of this customer. And they're going to architect a solution. Never they're going to touch. We're not talking about configuring anything no. here. So we're just talking what products and solution will meet your needs. Okay. This is, and based on their understanding, which is strong, but it's, uh, they're going to put something together. Then, as you mentioned, you're going to fly back home or, you know, whatever. Now you're going to get off your zoom call and start an internal zoom call and ask, some back end, you know, corporate engineers, perhaps. Um, this is what I propose. Can you tell me, are there any holes in what I did, right? Tell me all the gotchas that aren't, you know, that I haven't read all the release notes. And you're going to get confirmation of that. But you're right. I mean, they're not configuring these things. They're not um, writing, they're definitely not writing code. Oh, God, <laughs> that's no. a treasured, you know, that's what this sync, a very small group of people who are very sanctioned to do that. And uh, no, that's not open for people. So, I mean, I think it's always important to be, you know, I think everybody's open to good ideas, but uh, engineers code, architects solve problems, build networks, and then uh, need to do the checks and balances, need to do the Q&A and make sure that the design that they built is truly going to work because we're past the sales stage, right? Yep. They've yep. bought our product. So, but now what we promised we said we're going to do, we really need to do it. So they do need to do the due diligence on making sure we're going to follow through and we're to deliver because a program manager, customer success, and architect will be held accountable. I have, I'm sure you've been on projects, Mike, and many of you in the call where you're on projects saying, hey, I remember during the sales pitch, you told us it would do X, Y, Z, you know, so it's, it's we're part of the solution. We need to make true on our promises, including the architect, right? Absolutely. In fact, I remember architecting designs that we promised things that we didn't even have for a year. And we <laughs> couldn't even recognize the revenue or take in the sale of the money that we put in. We had to keep it in a separate escrow account until we were able to deliver what we committed to the customer. Because otherwise, you had to give the money back because you weren't honoring your commitments. So definitely, definitely, definitely. If you commit to doing something, you do it. You deliver yeah. it with excellence. You deliver it with honor. And if something's broken, you fix it fast. Mm -hmm. And when something breaks and you fix it fast and the customer knows you're out there, boy, they become a loyal customer. Yes. Yes, where I, I'm at now at Versa, it's Versa Networks. It's really one of our, it's really helped us succeed. And you know some of the engineering um, management we have and the responsiveness to customers, they're blown away. They're like, what? You know, they were prepared for us to give them a target date of, you know, a couple months, several months. And we turn it around so quickly and there's literally per people working around the clock and because they value that customer's business so much. And you're not going to maybe, I don't want to um, say anything that's not positive about another company, but that may not happen at all companies. Let's just be sure. honest, right? You're going to be with some of the big boys that are going to say, okay, we got that logged. Thank you. <laughs> you know, you'll hear from our TAC in 12 to seven, 12 to 24 days. This is a priority blank. And, but uh, so it's very good. Uh, but even if you're at a big company that is processes moves, it's important for you as an individual to, um, to communicate well and com communicate often. Keep people so it's a great in. question. I think I'll answer Chin Lim's question and then we'll go back to this. So yeah. Chin, a product manager is someone that manages the release of a product. So maybe you're in charge of say the next video conferencing device, or maybe you're responsible for the new VPN, or maybe you're responsible for a new routing for a new router. I, so that's what a program, a product manager does. 
I kind of did a lot of these. I wrote a lot of product requirements, definitions related to multicast on routers and switches. So the product manager is the person that owns the release of the product from start one to start two, at least the product managers that I've worked with. How about yourself, Andrea? Yeah, I agree. They're part of the marketing group, right? As opposed to, I'm talking here about either being part of sales, you could be part of support, you could be part of some other group, but marketing has its own division, its own group, and they're out there to uh, bring a product from inception to go through all the product life cycle stages and manage that, get the product definitions. Um, so it's a very different job. So um, good question, but yeah, it's exactly has, as you said. It's a great one. So I figure we'll talk a few more minutes in about five minutes or 10 minutes. We'll basically start answering questions because there's getting a lot of questions and I'm excited to have this. One thing that I'll, I'll ask you, and I'll, I'll answer it as well. Um, what kind of major lessons have you learned in the years we've been doing this? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Let's see, major lessons, I would say, I've kind of woven them into my uh, talking points so far, I think. Treating people with respect. Um, is a major lesson that sometimes for me, I can get very focused on the job, right? It's the results that matter, you know, and, you know, well, you're not here. Okay. I don't want to hear from you anymore. You can't deliver, you know, and just being too, you know, we used to say being results oriented was a positive thing on a resume. I probably still have it on there, but now it's kind of, okay, let's look at this a little more ho holistically results do matter but it's not any which way you can. You don't want to tear down everyone in front of you or in back of you to get where you need to be. So learning that respect um, and treating others like, uh, you know, I don't want to say a simple saying, but treating others the way you would want to be treated. I mean, small example the other day, uh, we use, as everyone uses, instant messaging. And I was needing help and I thought I was talking to this offshore support desk. And the way I was talking to them, I was comfortable, right? But I was like, um, they were talking back and I'm like, did they read my question? You know, I'm like, did you write? And I wrote, did you read what I just wrote? So then he answers. Anyways, long story short, we go back and forth and I realize it's like the head of our QA. <laughs> and I did the total, oh, it's you. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> right. It's that, would I have talked to him that way if I knew who he was? And that was terrible. I felt terrible, right? That I was, oh, well, I thought it was such and such. Therefore, I was talking to him in a different way. That's all BS, right? That That's all the shame, you know, and we should know, be no respecter of person because we've all been at different jobs and at different places. And so I think that that really hits home for me as a lesson learned. Also being uh, honest and following through with your customers, you know, just that saying about, at any, we're gonna be making decisions and making commitments at many points during the customer's life cycle, right? While they're with us, while they're design stage, while they're in deploying, you know, oh, that's a feature request, we'll get to that. Oh yes, I understand your need, we're gonna improve that. Do we follow through on those things? Say, mean what we say, say what we mean. So being authentic, I think that's the, the word in general, I would say is being authentic and you know, we've got to have thick skin. It's a tough game, right? It's, <laughs> you're going to run into all sorts of people around the workplace at, in your own company, at customers that, you know, as a vendor, they're going to, if you're at, with a vendor, they're going to, they're going to have certain, uh, you know, a mindset about you. And so sometimes that's nice. Sometimes it's really positive and they treat you as an individual or sometimes they view you as just the vendor. You know, how many times have we been told um, you're going to need to earn our trust, right? It's yeah. like, okay, so it's like all these relationships, you've done it over and over and you have to keep proving yourself. So oh, all of those things, I think. And you know, I'm going to add to that. Sometimes the best way to develop a relationship is be just so honest. And even if it's not something you want to say. So for example, in my last trip to Dubai at that company we used to work for, the customer asked me, they said, well, it wasn't my last trip. It was the trip previous to the last trip because I, I was still planning on being at Riverstone for the long term. And Rizwan from the customer says to me, Mike, is this Riverstone box really the best box right now for what we're trying to do? 
I took a deep breath and I was thinking about the routing code that was slightly problematic at the time. And I was thinking about some trouble that we were having with certain FPGAs and ASICs. I took a deep breath and I said, Rizwan, I wish I could tell you that this was the best box in the world right now. When this product was sold to you a year and a half ago, it was by far the best. Right now, Cisco's product's about 5% better. I have to be honest with you, you asked me an honest question. And you know what Rizwan and Suleiman and all these people said to me? They said, thank you, Michael. That's what we're going to order from you again. And I looked at them and they said, you're the only person that we know that's going to walk in here, travel 7,000 miles to get here, and tell us to buy your competitor's product. They said, I can't find that anywhere, and I want yours again, as long as you, you, you keep coming back. So there's that. Never, yes. never let neglect the value of trust. When, all, when you have a reputation for being honest with integrity, and your reputation follows you, it really follows you. Yes. And your other people's reputation is, I'll do anything to make a sale. Right. Good it's point. not short-term success. You no. know, I like to say I've been in this field for 25 years because I don't like to admit how long I've really been in it. So, <laughs> you know, what happened is I did not trample over a lot of people. The only accidental trampling I've ever done was with regards to two people. One time I interviewed for a job and I didn't know that someone from my team was interviewing for the job. It was a job for an architect on a medical team. I was obviously the ideal choice because I could practice medicine. The other person was a systems engineer. My friend calls me and he's like, Mike, you took my job away. I'm like, what do you mean I took your job away? He said, did you know I had four interviews for this job so far? The healthcare architect, you had one interview with the VP and they basically canceled the position and used that to fund your position? I said, I didn't know. He said, did you know that I was interviewing? I, said, I didn't know. If you would have told me you're interviewing for a healthcare job, I wouldn't have taken it. I had another option. I would have taken this leadership role, but I didn't know. And of course, we're still friends 20 years later. So I'd say, don't trample over anyone to get ahead. Yes. There's times where you basically can't support people if they're doing things that are wrong or unethical or inappropriate, but don't trample someone to get ahead. It'll, it'll, it'll cost you so much more in the long term. Yeah, absolutely. So here's a question for you. So you've done large scale data centers. And you've done huge networks. I mean, huge networks. So guess what? When I tell my people, you are doing a cloud migration, what are you moving? You're moving the network and the data center tech, and that's it. So, I mean, realistically, and I know you're doing them too. You know, Andrea and I, we've been working on clouds for a long time. <laughs> I don't know how long Andrea has, but I will tell you that I've been working on clouds since, well, 1998 was the first cloud I worked on. So, you know. That's how long the cloud is, and there's nothing new in cloud computing. Every yeah. day, it's a new, new feature, new, new feature that we were using 25 years ago. But the good news is there's nothing to learn if you actually know the old tech. Know the old tech, and you're always going to the new tech. What goes into really building, you know, thinking about how do you deploy one of these things where you need 50 engineers to help you build it out? And what kind of things do you think about how to plan something that big? Well, um, it's a good question. I think that uh, at the design stage, right? And that's why design architects are so important. You're going to need fewer people to design it than to roll it out, right? Yeah. So you really want to get the best and brightest designing it. Then, uh, so no matter what the size, you know, maybe you'll, you'll need a few more people uh, and people who are aware of capacity, you know, um, but a good design is a good design. And, you know, our friend Moses, yes. you know, who about that, he he actually said the same thing. I talked with him a, sometime uh, a couple of years ago and he said, you know, I can't believe how much things change and then how much things stays the same. So exactly what you said, <laughs> you know, Ethernet is Ethernet still. <laughs> but anyways, um, you, you focus on the design. You have your design. You look at scalability. Of course, that's going to come into play with large networks. And you're going to really test your hardware, wherever that platform may be. You really need to know how far you can take it. And that's the only additional really uh, dynamic with these really large networks is scalability. Because you're going to, it's not all going to be this, you know, huge one data center. It's going to be distributed. So you're needing to build a team with a focus on a strong design team up front, the best and the brightest if possible. Then you're looking at implementation. And that's where you really need to work out the logistics 
and where you would get someone like a um, you know network engineers hopefully you'd have an architect they would stay on that role because let's face it you know we sometimes run into things that weren't taken into account and the the design may need to be adjusted if necessary so they're on board for any design assistance and then you've got a team of network engineers possibly project managers who help um, do the rollout and make sure each site is taken care of um, and so that team can grow, obviously, so um, domestically, globally, et cetera, and the communication for all of that needs to be handled very carefully. So usually a team of engineers, maybe um, sometimes you get a smart hands remotely to do some things in, in distant remote you know, closets, whatever the case may be, and then you have project manager to tie it up and communicate. Uh, you mentioned Moses's name. So Moses is a really close friend of mine. Moses is someone I used to speak to almost every day. When I hurt my foot and couldn't walk for years, I kind of went into like this little tunnel when I did nothing other than physical therapy. But I was an architect. Moses was an engineer. Moses is one of those engineers that's so good that when you go to his house, and this is, this is almost 20 years ago, he was figuring out a way on his black and white phone with his thumbs to order pizza. Then you'd walk in his house and 20 years ago, he was changing the lights with his little flip phone. And then when you get past the lights that would change, you'd have this automated thing in his house. Moses was one of those engineers that was so good, so smart, but most importantly, so decent and so loyal. And I trusted mm -hmm. him anywhere. And no matter what customer I could bring him with, they loved him because they yeah. felt who he was. Yes. Yeah, he's you can tell people's qualities, right? And uh, yeah, loved Moses. I mean, he's still Moses. <laughs> yeah. You know, my reaction to when Mike, well, I thought Mike was leaving and then even Moses, I, you know, I do get person, you know, you, you become close to those you work with and especially the, the really good ones and the personable ones. So, you know, at work, you end up building a little family, you know, and you keep in touch with people and it's really great. We've worked some, I think from Riverstone, so on different companies, you, you build a, you know, a few small friends that you keep in touch with usually for a long time. And I think that's so essential. And, you know, one day I'm going to steal you away from your people, but I know who you work for and they're really good people. So Andrew works for some of the most technically adept people I have ever met. So <laughs> much so that the founder of that company, Kumar, he gave me a BGP interview 20 some years ago. Here's what I remember. He asked one question, he asked another question, he asked another question, he asked another question. Somehow, you know, I must have eaten my witties that day. I took eight and a bunch of salmon, took eaten a bunch of blueberries and fish oil because I was smart that day. It doesn't happen <laughs> every day, but that day I was really smart. For 45 minutes straight, I was able to answer his question. He finally asked me something that was inside of a message of a message of a message. <laughs> and I finally looked at him and said, Kumar, I wish I could answer that, but I just have honestly have no idea. And he starts laughing, he says, Interview's over. And I said, what? He said, I wanted to see what was going to happen. First, if there was a place I could stump you. And two, what was going to happen when I stumped you? Were you going to lie to me or not? That's what he wanted mm -hmm. to know. And he said, you didn't lie to me. What an interview you did, but you didn't lie to me. And he's like, I'm going to make a recommendation that we need you. And I, the next day I had an offer. Yeah. But Kumar He's and his brother are perver, two IIT oh. graduates that have led engineering for Juniper Networks, that founded the company you're in, that basically ran engineering at Riverstone. I mean, those two are pretty impressive people. Yes, they are. <laughs> and they're still just as impressive. It's very. Yeah, I, I can't imagine either one of those two could ever potentially slow down. I don't think so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see that in their DNA. <laughs> I don't see it, but, you know. Bryson Networks, as you mentioned, is one of these technology companies that does software-defined networking, and the people that are there are unbelievable. They can run circles around lots of people. I have worked in that company with 200 people, and we were doing the work that organizations that had 4,000 people did. So we all worked hard. Now we're doing. We were a family. Now we're leaders in SASE, Secure Access, uh, Secure Access Security Edge. Um, but yes, it's a very exciting time. It's, it's, um, this is who provides your work from home access, work from anywhere and provides you a proxy to the internet, uh, all types of security. So we're really pressing in. We dominated, I think the SD WAN field, and now we're getting in on, uh, we're, we're doing the same with SASE. So it's very exciting. Hmm. 
I think I'm going to have to ask one of those official smart people from your company to talk about SD WAN. Maybe I'll call yeah. Joe. You do. Um, my old awesome. manager that's now running sales that's got a real strong engineering background and a great people background. And also, you know, me, you know, my warrior background. So he's with Marine. So that always helps too. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's... And you want to take a day off, but definitely the rest of the time. Yes. He's softened up in his age, but what a good guy he always has been. Oh, yeah. So excellent. So any major lessons that you would give uh, that you've learned over the years? And then we've got a lot of questions. Um, well, <laughs> I think I've woven them in and out of my conversation enough. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start taking some questions then. Oh, this is a good question from Isaac. Isaac's a really, really smart uh, IAM architect who's with me, also a network guy who's also learning about cloud for me. So I, I, the projects that I know for the most part since I joined Cisco were all these big things that nobody ever did before and they all took years and years and years and years and years. So, but you're, you know, you mid-sized projects. Have you worked on mid-sized projects or are they all huge ones? Well, I've worked on some mid-size. I mean, everyone has a different definition for those, but um, let's see, a typical timeline uh, from pre-sales to installation. Well, uh, it's very hard to put um, weeks or months to something because there's parameters that are unknown. You know, are there hardware dependencies? Supply chain is a real issue right now with COVID. And with the manufacturing shortages, I mean, it's really impacting things. So let's say we had all the hardware we needed. We had the right software release. We had the right people. And let's just assume in a magical world that that's there. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I would say that a uh, mid-sized project from pre-sales. And th these are these are the things I care about, right? Is Was it documented in pre-sales? I would ask the pre-sales engineer, okay, what, what is the customer expecting? Give me a heads up before I go in that, right? <laughs> Tell me what you sold and, and don't just give me the product data sheet, right? But tell me, I would really like to see the presentation. You know, were there any notes? Were there any uh, timelines, features, milestone? That's my first one. So make sure those are manageable. And then um, once, let's say, again, in our magical world that it all is, and we work and assemble a team, um, either you know, in-house or you're using, uh, hopefully, you know, you your company may have a professional services team. Our company has a really strong one. So we would fill out a, uh, we'd work on a scope of work with our professional services manager, make sure the customer agrees to it, exchange what needs to ex be exchanged to get that going and then uh, hold the kickoff meeting. So there, there's, these are the times where you would want uh, the role I was talking about, like a day-to-day -day project manager. Uh, now, if it was mid-size, you may not have one, right? So it just depends. But even sometimes there'll be internal resources to do that uh, and just to make sure your, your projects go quickly. So um, mid-size project, I don't know um, what your definition of that is, but maybe we say 12 sites. Um, and so it's not you know a one or two siter, but it's not 3,000 sites. So 12 sites, you know, we do the design, um, and then we're ready for installation. It's assuming it's pretty cookie cutter. It can be done in a matter of, of months, I would say, you know, short number of months. But those are the factors that you would look into. And it's a great question and it's a great answer. Obviously, for these 3,000 sites, we're not doing it in a matter of months. Right. Obviously, <laughs> we're not doing billion dollar designs in a matter of months. It's a matter of years. But some of these things, you know, 20 sites, 12 sites. Yeah, that's what we consider mid-sized projects, 12 sites that each have, you know, 500 or 1,000 people working there. That's mm -hmm. a, a mid-sized project, so great answer. Who else has a question? Angela Thomas, I'm so happy to see you. Angela was one of my students. She's a cloud architect, and she's really fantastic, super nice. Um, please elaborate on specific, specific projects, sample requirements, solutions, and architect responsibilities where appropriate. Okay, so nice I think that's question. a question for both of us. So <laughs> yeah. um, why don't you start with some projects and then I'll talk about the architect things. And wow, I'm so happy to see Angela Thomas. I haven't seen her in a little while. She was 
such a great student. And well, I always with her. her. Yeah, with her question, it's such a great question. Who could not like her? <laughs> but, you know, let's see. So uh, specific projects, sample requirements. So um, let's see. I'll, I'll take one from my, my previous um, job, a, a specific project to roll out. Let's say we were doing UCAS, right? Unified Communications as a Service. So we had to... Um, deploy this for um, a, we were big in the um, education vertical. My last company, well, several verticals, that was one of them. So uh, there we would have to, we started off uh, a lot of our projects, what we would call a data collection spreadsheet. So in some ways, it's somewhere where you're gonna collect all the data you need, right? To do your project. How do I design this network? What do I need in order to fulfill the customer's business uh, request is you need to collect all that data somewhere. Sometimes it's going to be a list of names, a list of users. Sometimes it's just going to be a meeting with a network engineer. It's all going to depend um, as we get to more, more consumer type software or consumer, a little bit consumer or employees working from home, employees um, using instant unified messaging from their work, the more and more data is needed. So uh, to customize that solution. So there's experts just on data collection, you know, who can do the best data collection spreadsheet, the best template, et cetera. So you need a lot of time for data collection. Uh, you need a lot of time for reviewing of all the data collection, coming up with your, de your design. Um, and then that's where, let's say, um, you, then you're going to review your solutions, right? So I say the architect is going to have a good understanding of all the solutions that are available in your portfolio. So you should have someone on your team, whether it's you, you along with others say, well, when I hear the requirements, I was thinking, so usually I would come in there. I, I was thinking this, does that make sense? And that's, well, yes, but we're gonna need to add this, this, and this. So you start having that discussion um, on what you believe the solution might look like. And then you really wanna get in with the architects, like, well, we're not gonna just guess, you know? <laughs> So then we're going to bring in the architect and say, okay, here's everything we have. Here's the customer's requirements. Here's everything we know. And then you want to give it over to your architect. So I'll leave with you, Mike. Okay. So then it comes over to us and then we start evaluating what we think we see. And then of course we've got questions. The first thing we're going to do is go back to the sales engineers that came up with this idea and say, what is it? And then we're going to say, how does it work? We're going to look through that documentation. We're going to ask that. Then we're going to get really careful with them and the sales reps and figure out what they promised the customer, assuming this was engineer design and not architecture design. Then we're going to take a step back. Then I'm going to go to all the smartest corporate resources that I know, the people that are focused on one person that's the multicast person, for example, assuming that wasn't me. I'm going to go to the security person. I'm going to go to the network person. I'm going to go to the software development person in the team. I'm going to go to the management or operations person in my team. I'm going to ask all of them. Well, this is the design. I would do it this way. Will this work? Will this be the, a way you can automate it? Will this enable management Will this, to manage it efficiently? Will this enable this? So I'm going to go back to that team. I'm going to go back and design it or fix, I fix the design. Hopefully I don't have to, but if necessary, fix the design. Go back with the leadership and then go back with that account team if necessary to fix the design. Now, once you've sold something to the customer and you've promised the customer it's going to work and you missed the module, you, the company, have to provide that for them. You can't say, sorry, this contract that you signed that we promised you is going to work. Oh, we missed this. <laughs> Give me these 10 routers and these 10 people. It's going to be another $20 million. No, no, no. You design it. You commit to it. And if it's not done, you make it right. And that's really, I'd say, the secret to success. I know you've done a lot of that, Andrea, and I know I've done a lot of it, too. Mm -hmm. it, fix it fast. Delight your customer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Angela, I'm so happy to see you. By the way, Angela, when you sent me a text message the other day and in the text message, you were asking me if this BGP speaker needed a summary or an aggregate adjust. God, I was happy about it. So great job, Andrew. You've become a heck of a cloud architect and we're so happy to see you here. Who's the next question? Arun. Well, how do you empathize with a customer who's completely unaware of your solutions? In other words, how do you feel reverse engineering works in resolving the customer's problem or providing a solution to customers? So, Arun, two questions. I have never had a customer that is unaware of my solution. 
I'm an architect. I advise them on my solution. I present a solution to them and I sell the solution. And before someone's going to spend, you know, 50 million or a hundred million dollars, they understand the solution. So I'm not completely sure I actually understand the question. Now there was a second half of that question that I might be able to answer. I just can't see it. It's not on screen. Yeah, Mike, I do have, I think there's something, I think there is times I've, I've had this. Okay. Where, um, let's say they're not part of the decision-making process because okay. that can happen, right? You have a, a team, let's say that was on the decision-making process. Then it's decided, okay, they're going to choose your solution. Now there's these other engineers maybe involved and they haven't really bought onto it, right? They weren't in there hearing all your pitches and your great explanations and they weren't part of that process. And I've had that before okay. where they're, and you can kind of tell they're like, explain that to me one more time. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> and you, you know, there comes the time, a point where they're either not understanding it because it may be complex or maybe they don't like the decision that was made without their input. You'd really need to understand more why they're not getting it. Is it a true, they're just not following it and maybe a one-on-one -on -one session is required or are they, you know, is there something else going on there? And that, that's a good point. I think the reason I've never experienced this is I did two things. Typically the engineers speak with the engineers and the architects speak with the executives. My life is a translator. Not, I just view myself as a translator. I translate between executive business requirements and technology solutions. And then I go explain it to engineers that are smart enough to go build it. So I've never sold a product where the engineers didn't know because I interface directly with the engineers. And the next day I'd be in front of the CEO and then I'd be translating it back to the engineers. So I never really had like a pure generic role. I always had these amorphous roles that I, you know, I never even knew what they were. They were all architecture, but they could have been a little bit of anything. They could have been... They were all they were all over the place. I guess that's the way I could describe it. Yeah, well, it's I think uh, I think that's a good point, and that's ideal. But sometimes, sometimes you do run into a situation where not everyone's been involved in the decision or seen everything that you expect. They haven't read all your stuff, right? I, I just had that just, and uh, sometimes you know it's a one-on-one -on -one session if you're willing to give free training. Sometimes yeah. I've offered training classes. You know, I try and get them comped so they don't have to pay for them, but you know, if you need to bring someone up to speed and you really need them on your team, you kind of want to go all out, right? If you need them on your team or if you're saying, you know what, you're not part of, you You know, maybe you're you're kind of dragging, I'm going to try and help you. And if you really want to learn this, if you are from training, if, if it need be, and, and discount it, if not free, then you'll see if they really want to learn it, right? Because if they never take that training, boy, that says a lot, you know. Sure does. That's a great point. Did we answer his question? Paul S. You oh. wanted to apply for a solution architect position, but you're not feeling confident. How can I help? Well, I'll actually answer this one because I actually have a program for this. So, Paul, this is why we have the Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Um, Chris from my team will put a link to it. He will also give you a 20% coupon code. He will put it in the window of, well, I don't know where you're at, whether you're on, on, on LinkedIn or whether you're on YouTube. Chris from my team will take care of that. Now, I will say this. The, what's covered in the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate and Professional is the name of a service and how to configure it. So it might say S3, and here's how to set up an S3 bucket. The problem is, is we architects don't configure anything. We go interact with the client. We go ask them, you know, what are you trying to achieve? What are your goals? What are your current systems look like? What are your competitors doing? And then we create a design. And then we sell the design. So we have a program that's basically... If for people in tech, it's 250 hours. For people that have never worked in tech, it's 500 hours, where we teach all of the architecture skills to basically teach you what you need to know, what do you need to know about the network? Because by the way, the cloud is a network and a data center, and you can't do the job without knowledge of the network and the data center. Without knowledge of the network, nothing works. Without knowledge of the data center, you can't move anything to the cloud, because what do we cloud architects do? We do something called lift and shift. We design a way to go from the data center to the cloud, which is just another data center. That's all it is. That's a data center availability zone. It's a data center, so nothing's changed. So do exactly um, what's, but learn the network, learn the data center, learn the communication skills, learn the leadership skills, the ROI modeling skills, the executive presence, emotional intelligence, communication skills, presentation skills, writing for executives, and then you'll be good to go. And that's the way to do it. 
so that's so hard. I, I saw it. I know some people are looking for a crash course, but the way you're delivering it is far and away the better way. I mean, you take a crash course and we probably all have at some point, but your classes are going to instill the real knowledge of what's needed. So it's not going to be a passing fancy. You're going to have that knowledge and be able to apply it to cloud, to data centers, to whatever you need. So it's, it's definitely the, the, the way to go. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Okay, Chinton. Oh, wow. Well, you, Chinton, you always have the nicest things to say. I'm so glad you're here. So glad I was able to bring actually Andrew to do this. Why are the job descriptions decided by HR? Huh. <laughs> Looking for one person who knows everything. <laughs> Well, I have my philosophy on these job descriptions and to let you know, I've never got a job by knowing it was on the job description. I looked at the job description as like something that HR wrote that was yeah. like, how much stuff can we throw in it so you don't apply? So <laughs> the people that do apply know everything about everything. And when I interviewed them, they were basically jack of all trades, master and none and not hireable. Yeah. So I used recruiters to find me people. But how about you, Andrew? What, what do you deal with these engineering roles that want you to be a programmer? a sales rep, a project <laughs> manager, um, an expert on networking, an expert on data centers, an expert on clouds, an expert on security. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, I, first of all, you know, point made a very well worded question and as well as your response. I think uh, the job descriptions and even hiring managers, I've been guilty of the same. And, you know, speaking of Riverstone, I remember writing one <laughs> when we were building a, a a tech center in India and you know boy I had all of our team and we all wrote up and and we sent it to Shantanu you remember the Shantanu yeah. was so wonderful and he said there's nobody on this earth that can do this <laughs> let it's not in India and it's none you know I couldn't do it and he's like you know star employee so he was a good check so we all need those checks and hopefully if if the company doesn't have them and you see one of these you know you must be superwoman, superman to to meet this job need. If you get the interview, I would uh, I would say you know somewhere closer to the top of the interview and say I'm really interested in hearing your perspective of what you need in this position. And maybe that might even be with the recruiter or HR that sends it. Uh, I did talk to one HR person who was super good, and uh, they they basically were able to tell you know, no, no, it's none of that. It's really this. So it's just how much are you willing, you know, are you willing to spend your time on that? Maybe get a good answer. Sometimes you can get someone who's more realistic. Sometimes you can't. Yeah. And because I mean, when I look at them, it's especially for architects, it's crazy. Um, but then again, I don't look at job descriptions. Here's how I create a job description. I'm going to be blunt and honest with this. I am not a job description writer. I am not a paperwork person. I'm either an architect or a leader. And they're really the only two things that I know other than practicing medicine, which you know, sort of maybe that's a, that's a hybrid between an architect and a leader, same kind of job. So when I write one, I go to the Zoom or Indeed or one of those other jobs, ZipRecruiter, I cut and paste something. I'm like, none of this is related to what I need. Let me just add the three lines that I need. But boy, this looks remarkably comprehensive. This is impressive. My manager is going to be very impressed with what I wrote with. And then I paste it up and it, it's like 16 different careers. But that's my guilty way of writing a job description. I say, you know, be able to do the main thing that they're asking for. And be so good at it, at least my perspective, that they have no choice but to need you. But, you know, what are you dealing with with these job descriptions? I know your company is a little smarter about writing them because you actually work for a pure tech company and they're excellent tech people. Yeah. Well, I think they do have the actual, we don't have HR, right? We don't have HR write them, that's for sure. We don't scan for keywords. It's a very strong leadership team, strong management, and they know what they're looking for. So if it, just as you said, it will be, you will just see what, what is needed. And in, um, I think that's key. Uh, in roles where I've hired for, et cetera, I've been guilty of kind of putting in the kitchen sink, like, oh, it'd be great if they had this and this, but they're all need, some are needs, and then most of them are, are nice to have. And sometimes I ask it that way, if you're in a uh, talk with someone and asking them, which are really mandatory requirements, you know, because I would, I've applied before where I didn't meet 
let's say they said something was required, some certificate, and, and I, didn't be, I didn't have that. I still applied and have a meeting and, and maybe they were really serious about it or maybe they said, you know, we could make it work. So it, it's pretty flexible. I would say try not to get turned off by the job description um, and still carry on. And uh, obviously I'm sure Mike has gone over with everyone how to use LinkedIn and to really get an in with someone because yeah, applying to just job descriptions to HR probably won't. Yeah, I don't use HR that. for anything. I've got 200 recruiters right now that we're working with for people, but you know, I want the recruiters to get paid the twenty, fifty thousand dollar commission to find somebody a job. I want them working for me because right. they actually are motivated. Not just that, the good ones are in. You deal with some of these really, really good recruiting companies. They have ins with the management. They know the yeah. management. They're like IBM, where they know everybody in the family. They're like me coming from Cisco, where I spent a hundred thousand dollars on lunches one year just in order to get close to the customer and really lead a team of engineers. I'm not joking. I'd bring 20 people to lunch every single day that were building a product, a project that I designed. I was there, you gotta listen, you gotta hear what the customer tells you. So, you know, I go straight to, H I don't go to HR, I go to the hiring manager. I, I don't no. think I, I, actually, I don't think I've ever applied to a job through HR in my entire career, except for mm. the first five jobs, the first couple of jobs I did before. At the beginning, you have no choice. <laughs> But I did want to correct something I said. I mentioned that Versa Networks is is a sassy leader, but I think I gave the wrong description. It's, it's Secure Access Service Edge. And I think I said Security Edge. Anyways, I just wanted to correct that. No, I'm glad you did. And that's, you know, that's where I struggle with acronyms because they all mean so many different things. I know. When I first, <laughs> the reason I tell everybody not to use acronyms, and in this case, you had no choice. But I remember when I first started, it was my first tech job. And somebody called me uh, in the middle of the night and they proceeded to say, you know, all these frame relay PVCs are going down. And I picked up them. I said, start a lidocaine bolus at one and a half milligrams per kilogram at this dosage per minute. And they looked at me and they're like, what, Mike? I said, you just told me they have excessive PVCs. We don't want them to go into VTAC. Give them a lidocaine bolus at one and a half milligrams per kilogram. <laughs> that was medical. He's like, Mike, what? <laughs> They're like, for a permanent virtual circuit, I'm like, oh, so sorry. I was thinking you were referring to premature ventricular contractions. You called me at 2.30 in the morning. That's what I was thinking. So, you know, that's the danger of acronym. It's true. But, you know, you have a very specific acronym. You're also from one of the most technical companies I've ever met. There are some companies where they've got exceptionally good business people and good technology people. And there are some companies that are just pure, pure, pure engineering based where the people there can solve world hunger engineering wise, but that's their focus is engineering, engineering, engineering. And Andrew's working at one of those really, really, really strong, hardcore engineering cultures. It is actually our CEO is from Cisco. He ran the service provider business for many okay. years, Kelly Ahusha. So he's very strong. You, okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Anyway. And, and Purva and Kumar, who founded the company that both ran engineering for Juniper Networks are yeah. pretty capable guys too. Pretty capable. That's exciting. Very exciting. Chris, okay. Okay. Should I address that, uh, yes, Mike? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see, timeline. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I may you need to, to use the timeline. Again. What? You don't have to use anything that makes you uncomfortable, like timeline. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's see, I started off actually, it's, uh, I, I started off, I worked at Honeywell, the very start of my career. And that's a huge company, right? And uh, no timeline, okay, <laughs> good. Okay, started off at Honeywell. And this is just, you know, the good fortune. So I was, it was around, it was a, during a recession. I don't remember which one. It was during a recession. I had graduated college uh, and, uh, you know, wasn't looking good, right? So I joined a local company, Honeywell, the local branch. And I was eager, right? I took everything serious, like, you know, <laughs> my life depended on. So if I were to look back, as you said, lessons, I'd probably lighten up a little bit.
but it also sometimes helped me with my career. But, you know, there's pros and cons to that. There's a price. So I was working at Honeywell and I was just doing anything I could. Oh, let me help you. Let me do this. You're right. And just eager beaver, you would call it, whatever. And then uh, there was an opportunity to learn training, networking, right? And so um, they paid for it all. And they're like, who wants to do it? And of course, I'm like, me. So, <laughs> so uh, I think they had recognized there that I, I was eager. And so I did that. And so I learned networking uh, pretty early in my career. And I re it really clicked. And even, you know, just small stuff, uh, getting the, you know, getting everyone hooked up with email, getting hooked up with um, uh, network facts, all these things were new to people. And so it was like, there was a great immediacy like a, of benefits. So I really liked that. It's like, oh, wow, look what I brought, you know, so it felt good. Um, so that motivated me. And I actually was on the technical side, believe it or not, Mike, you probably don't, you can't even imagine this, but I went to school, I went to trainings for you know, learning routers, configurations. And then I started, uh, then I, got my next job. So they treated me very well at Honeywell. I trained. I mean, uh, I stayed with them for a while. And then I went and I think I got, it was a network manager job, but I think I had, you know, one part-time person working for me. So it wasn't like I was this, you know, leading the broad team, but I was a manager. So was not expected to be as technical, but I tried to be. And um, so I was a net, I was both the hands-on person and the manager, but I also called in contractors when I needed it, when I, when I said I couldn't do it. So, and I worked for the CFO. So working for a CFO, obviously you're going to be challenged on every expense. So that taught me, you know, I had to do a return on investment for, I think a $30,000 piece of equipment, you know, or something. <laughs> it was just like, Oh my gosh, I look back at those times where, you know, you have to calculate, uh, an average wage and everyone will give you the same number, you know, <laughs> but anyways, do you know how many steps? To... <laughs> so I think um, what was key is I've always been hungry to learn and hungry to achieve. Uh, and that showed. And so people gave me opportunities because, and that's what I would look for in hiring people, by the way, is that hunger, right? Cause no one's going to have all the answers, but if someone says that I don't have all the answers, but I know where to look boom, they're good, right? You know, they're going to look for it. Because if someone says, I've got the, all the answers, don't trust them. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Anybody that thinks they know it all does not have the answers. Right, right. Yeah. In fact, you know, recently I saw a course provider that makes AWS courses, certification courses. It's never worked in networking, make an advanced networking course. Oh my God. I looked at this and I said, you know what you know as when you don't maybe you've never worked in networking you don't even know what you don't know right that's that the reminds story. me to the junior level when i was i took the ccna class and i was like okay i know networking and then i took the cisco certified network professional it's like i know some networking <laughs> then i became a cisco certified internet expert which is the hardest exam in the world and i wait there's a lot of networking i don't know and then i was a lead <laughs> architect and a principal architect and it's like wow I need a lot of people around me to help me do these things. So yeah, you got to like, do that. And what you did is you focused heavily on the right things. Yeah. I like Chris Johnson's. I did a container. Oh, wait, that person built their own cloud. <laughs> Someone's yeah. eager. And, and that's something we do. I actually have every one of my students build a cloud from scratch at one, in one of the servers in our data center. I figure if you're going to be a cloud architect, you can't just know how to configure the cloud. You must know how each and every part works because architecture is about design. So I have every one of my students actually build the cloud, which means occasionally I have to get technical too because I have a cloud running in my own house. But guess what? It's super important. You can't design what you don't know. Right. So it's getting so the I'll, right. I'll just finish up real quick. Uh, anyway, so I started on a technical path. I continued to do technical work. And then I was at a training technical training, I got into network management. I worked for a consultant, consulting company called INS. They were a really, really strong company. In fact, they had more CCIEs than Cisco at a point in time. So very, very right. strong. And uh, I worked there and then, you know, you understand the, the constraints of consulting is they can sell you as what they need to sell you as. So I'll, <laughs> even though I wasn't uh, an engineer, the uh, anyways, they. I was sold into a role that had to be much more technical and it was very stressful for me. I mean, I was, 
and I talk about learning to lean on people that are more technical than you. There was this engineer there. I still remember him, Chris. And I would go to him in the morning and the evening. And I'd deliver, what's this? What's that? What's this mean? Because I took a, um, I was very interested in network management. So I did HP OpenView. You remember all those? I remember that. Program. So then it got, and everyone would ha start having their um, many more programs like that. So it got very technical. Then I made a decision point whether to stay technical, go in management. Then I went in management um, because it was driving me crazy. Anyways, uh, from there, and then it was just kind of opportunities where where an opportunity came and what company seemed excited. I then I joined Riverstone. Um, well, I, I worked for AT and T Wireless for a while in network. I was the manager of the network there, and um, you know, I just that's where you're out of this big company and you assume everyone knows. I'm like, I remember talking to the application guy, right, and he was you know, having Oracle everywhere. And I, I remember just telling him, that application's too chatty. And and they just thought that was hilarious that I said that. They're like, define that. I'm like, what do you mean? It's just talking all the time. <laughs> I thought everyone would know what that meant, but they didn't. Anyways, going on from that, I just continued. Then I joined Riverstone with met Mike, got more into, you know, working for a manufacturer, which is a different, a different decision point. And I really liked it much more, even though Sometimes it seemed nice to be work for the customer, but it is cool to work for a manufacturer as well. I really like it now. I'm kind of stayed with that. So um, been a few different jobs, kind of doing the same thing um, for a while now, you know, different, different roles, definitely. And big organizations change a lot. So you can be at a company for a long time, maybe, and do many different roles. But that's how my career trajectory has landed me. Um, and it's been very rewarding. You know, been very rewarding. There's challenges, of of course, but it's been very good. And I knew it. I knew it all this time. When I told you about complicated multicast things and you pretended you were just a manager, I saw it in your eyes and your body language that you understood. <laughs> I don't know about that. But that I, was I hard knew you me. did, but that's what, then again, um, but I knew you knew. Yeah. Yeah. I was hands on. <laughs> that's a good question it is um i think you run there's two there is a good and a bad of doing it this way so the good is it's always good to present a menu of options to your client love that it's really good the problem is when you're presenting at the ceo level for the most part you've got about one tenth of a second to grab their attention and you have to come up with a solution that you recommend and then after that you provide the substantiating evidence and you can also talk about additional um, solutions, additional designs that we're and the benefits and weaknesses, but why we've chosen the right one. But make it clear the right one is the right one up top, and then provide the substantiating evidence. Engineers do this. Engineers talk about all the problems and how they've created a solution. Architects, executives want the solution first, and then they want the substantiating evidence second. So. Flip it around unless you're good coming point. from the sales world, mm -hmm. and then you'll be good. But definitely provide one solution and then talk about alternative solutions considered and why or why and, and the strengths and the weaknesses and why or why not you recommend them and say this could be a good alternative if you're trying to save here. This would be a yeah. good alternative should you not need X, Y, or Z. But make sure you just give them one thing that's really complete that's boom to the point. Yes, but uh, I like the way you turned his gold, silver, and bronze into an alternative if you're uh, trying to save money you know that's because no one wants to be told you know oh we'll choose the bronze right it's just something not you know so you want to probably phrase that a little differently but i think your your point is is a good question it is as mike said you definitely want to provide options uh, provide what you recommend make that your main point but always the options the yeah, options are great yeah Jesse thank Murdoch, you. thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. That so, means a lot to me. Jesse is 24 years old, living in San Francisco. I oh. need to connect him with Moses. I need to connect him with my student, Mitchell, um, that I trained that was a senior program manager or product manager at Cisco within two years of graduation. That's now a security architect at Zscaler. Oh. So definitely. And of course, I'll probably drag him on one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're reading the question. I guess that's clear. <laughs> yeah, I guess we should probably I'll actually do this in case this audio gets turned into some other podcast that we have. So from Alonzo, my good friend, great cloud architect, also a good program manager. Um, could you provide an example of working on a project with conflicting personalities? How do you handle it? Did the experience affect the project? And what was the outcome? Yes. <laughs> yes, I have examples of those. It's usually, um, yeah, uh, one thing. Um, <laughs> Chris is laughing. <laughs> yeah. How many times? Let's see. When did you not have a project with conflicting personalities? <laughs> but yes, uh, I mean, it happens a lot. And it's something um, if you're taking on a role where you're responsible for the project or the success of the, uh, the account, you know, in any type of, uh, you know, common responsibility, you're always going to encounter this. And I think that's you know, we used to call people, it used to be a term that people would say dysfunctional, but everybody's dysfunctional, right? And we're all shoving ourselves in this little office or virtual office and trying to work together. And so we all have our different hangups. So of course that's gonna happen. And what motivates me isn't gonna motivate Mike versus you, et cetera. So um, that does, it can definitely, if you have too much conflict on your team, it, and it becomes obvious to the, say, the customer or even other people internally, it's demotivating, it's distracting, it's difficult to stick to the goal. So it's important to, I like to try and address that head on, right? Don't try and shy away from it, pretend it doesn't exist. It just rears its ugly head louder and stronger. So I would, I would try and address that always one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, that's not something you want to bring up in a team meeting. Like, hey, does anyone have any problems on the project? Let's just have it all out because everyone will. And they may start pointing fingers at you, he, she, everybody. So try and address it one-on-one -on -one and, and try. Now, I say, I say these tries, and of course, myself, I could be doing it wrong 99.99% of the time. But I'd like to think I'm trying. I'm getting better as, as I as I do it. Uh, there was a time when I would I would not really care if a person had a different opinion, and that's what I mean about caring about the whole person. Whereas now, okay, why do you feel that way? Why do you want to you know ask questions, trying to get the bottom of? Because often people aren't going to say I don't feel appreciated. They're not going to say that. They're going to say I hate that design. He's an idiot. She doesn't know what she's talking about. But they're not saying you know, what they really mean, what their real emotion is inside them. So you kind of have to put, as Mike said earlier, psychologist hat on, <laughs> you know, what, what is it about them that's bothering you? And, and try to ask questions in a non-judgmental way in that term that makes them feel safe, that they can express themselves. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, we want to get the best out of every member on our team. And when that's not happening, and, you know, you really do need to address it the best you can. And um, you try on your own. You try to enlist the help of others. I mean, I really, I, I think it's really worth the effort to try and resolve. You may not be able to do it in and of yourself, but um, it will be obvious. Believe me, it's obvious. The tone starts coming out, even though, you know, it just comes out to the customer and to others when there's discord. So I would just, um, I don't have a simple solution, right? Because each solution is, each problem is different. But try and work with that person or persons individually. Try not to take it personally because, you know, sometimes it'll be, well, Andrea, you're changing priorities on me. You know, sometimes it'll all be, it could be pointed at me if I'm program manager or, you know, or I'll take it as pointing at me when they're not meaning that. And they're not really upset at me, right? They're mad at they're mad usually at something, some underlying issue that they're not able to communicate with, but we need to, it's like turning a technical requirement into a business need. You need to turn their complaint into an actionable request. <laughs> I think I that's that a answers really good point. I'm going to also add one thing because this is yeah. something I struggled with in my youth. I'm better at it now, but I struggle with in my youth. There are times there's someone on your team that will just drive you nuts. For example, I wanted to move to Florida so badly when I was at Cisco, I joined the channel. 
which was not really the place where I wanted to be long term, but I worked with some really great people and they let me work from home in Florida and that was better than living in the New York Metro. And there was this character on my team that didn't think it was important to know about the industry for which you were working. In fact, I remember there was a healthcare vertical and I said, I wonder if I should apply for this. And the person said, why would you apply for a healthcare architect position? I said, well, for one thing, I can practice medicine and I know a little bit about healthcare. And he says, it's irrelevant whether you can practice medicine or not. You just need to design the tech. And I started to say, yo, you idiot. Um, how do you design a solution if you don't understand the business? How do you do this if you don't know after this? And my manager there was there. My manager looked at me and he pulled me aside and he said, Mike, don't reduce yourself to this person's level. Obviously, this person has no idea. Obviously, you're a leader. Don't reduce yourself to some other person's level. My manager then proceeded to say, look, when you're dealing with someone that's not rational and you're rational and you go to their level, they're going to take you to their area of expertise, which is being irrational. And if you're a rational person, you don't know how to play the game with them. You're going to get swallowed up by the irrationalness. I took a couple of deep breaths. I went back. And I was nice to the guy and it changed everything. I realized he was just insecure. Yeah. I asked him what was going on. And he's like, look, you're the only CCIO on the team. Everybody loves you. I said, I'm no different than you. I just happen to know this. You know this, this, and this. Instead of worrying about what I know, let's talk about what you know. I'm even going to get you some recognition for it. And then he was like, you would do that for me? And I said, look. We're on the same team. I said, look, if I know the business side of this and you know the technical side better than me, help me with the tech. I'll help you with the business. Then you'll get to your goals. I said, there's no reason for any of this. And it changed everything. But had I not like had my manager at the time, and this was 20 some years ago, basically say, Mike, seriously, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, that made it very clear. Now, then I got promoted, then I brought my manager up, then I got promoted a second time, then I brought my manager up. Now he's a VP over at NVIDIA. What a great guy he is. What great lessons he taught me over the years. And I've got to say, don't reduce yourself to someone's level. If someone's frustrated, as Andrea said, figure out why they're frustrated, soothe the frustration, and create a better relationship for them, and whenever possible. But just don't bring yourself to that level, because I've done it, and there's no winning. Yeah, guilty. Ah, my two ears. <laughs> Thank you, Obina. Obina is another wonderful, my, my amazing student. Great. I love the name. Beautiful. Samir, uh, you're bringing in Very. an amazing guest every day. Your love and care for students is amazing. Please get a person from the security domain if possible. Samir, I will definitely do that. I know some good people. Great recommendation. Okay, so we see the first half of that question one more time. How to convince the customer in terms of cost, solution, time frame to finish product when they have a deadline, when compromise with the customer is need for needed for the product. Okay, so I'm not sure which question you're actually asking for. Are you asking with regards to how to sell the project? Are you asking with regards to how to manage the project? or how to compromise over things that your company's initiatives are different than another company's initiatives. At least that's the three questions that I interpreted. Maybe you had a different perspective, Andrew, when you read it. Okay, so how to convince the customer in terms of cost, solution, and time frame to finish the project when they have a deadline. When compromise with the customer is well, maybe oh, maybe when when we need to compromise with the customer. Yeah, I think it's two parties. I mean, Mohammed. Yeah, managing. Okay, yeah, managing the the customer, and that is what you're going to need to be doing, even at the and an architect, right, Mike? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not like oh, this is up to management. No, this is, <laughs> you know ensuring that they are your customer is sold on your projections of how much time it needs how much they're going to need to spend and um 
what items are going to be in that deployment schedule are all, all items that will come to technical people sometimes first before they come to anyone else, right? Because, that, hey, this is the guy who knows it all. He designed it. Let me ask you, you know, can you do this, this, and this without me having to buy that? You know, and they're going to ask you to see if, can you still get me that even though I don't buy this? And because they may not bring that up to maybe program manager or some other role, but they feel a kinship, right? Engineer to engineer, as you said earlier. Mm -hmm. So that's a tough spot to be in. And you, you would need to, um, there's times that we can, you know, I'd be surprised. Sometimes I think it's, no, that's done. You paid for it. We can, there can meet, can, there's no modification whatsoever. And that's not true, right? We're living in the real world. We want customers. Customers are why we have jobs. So um, we find a way. Now, if a customer is trying to get something for nothing, that that's sometimes, uh, and you would know that, let's say they're laying their cards on the table with you, but not others, it would be good for you to provide that value to your other colleagues to say, hey, by the way, they're having financial problems, I heard, because they're asking me to do this, this, and this, or get it done to me, get it done in a smaller time frame, you know, and let's, you know, all you can do, basically, what I feel is put the customer's request forth. Don't feel you have to answer it alone. You know, say, I'll look into it, right? That's all you can do. Thank you for coming to me. I'm going to look into that for you, and we're going to get back to you. And then bring it to your team, whoever that is, to have a discussion and just, you know, lay it out for them. And I think people people want to keep customers, you know, right? This is... Uh, we're all about maintaining, keeping our customers, having that return revenue. So if there's something we, we need to do as a company, I think I, I'm usually surprised at how much we'll bend, right? Where maybe I'm used to not bending at all and, you know, no, this is the way it goes. And sometimes the lower on the ladder you go, sometimes the more, you know, firm we'll be. Like, no, there's no except, exceptions. No, I'm sorry. You signed it. That's it. We go higher and higher and you'll realize Anything is possible. You know, we do things for customers because that's what we need. That's how we get revenue. So I, I, I don't know if that answered your question, Mike, and maybe you could add. I'll add to the first half of it with regards to the sales side. I think you did the perfect job answer on the, the setting expectations. Now, on the sales side, because I've done a lot of sales, I've personally closed billion-dollar deals without sales reps. It wasn't supposed to happen that way. It just happened. I personally closed massive deals in the Middle East when there were sales reps weren't were, were like laid off, for example. So here's how I sell, and this is how the most successful sales reps that I've ever met sell, those that have done huge dollar buying. I don't sell anything. I make that very clear. I interact with the customer and I look and evaluate what challenges they actually have. And after I know what challenges they actually have, I'm not sure where Andrew's photo went, um, but after I know exactly the challenges that my customer has, then I actually figure out the business, what it's gonna do. So, for example, um, if I was working with a hospital and the hospital, for example, had a million and one nurses, let's say they had a thousand nurses. If the technology could save each nurse two hours per day and they had a thousand nurses, I would calculate the $50 an hour, which they're paying to the nurse, times the two hours per day, times the, then the thousand nurses that they have, times 365 days a year, and I'd find a cost for that then I could say this technology solution can save you two hours a day per nursing time, which we evaluated in a proof of concept. Therefore, the cost to you of the solution is about $3 million. The savings in nursing overtime each year is the following $6 million. So therefore, this, this $3 million solution is more than mitigated by the $6 million product, by the $6 million savings per year. So the key with selling is identifying your customer, figuring out the customer's challenge, and designing a solution that will solve their problems where the solution provides much greater value for the customer than the cost of the tech. And that's why for architects, it's essential to know how to do ROI modeling. You have to be able to assess the cost of the problem. You have to be able to assess the expected value, meaning the chances that your solution will, be, will work. And you have to multiply that times what the value of the solution is if it's 100% perfect. And that gives you a number. You need that number. You need those ROI models. You need to convince the customer that their, their solution provides us a profitability to them or something good to them. It's not just, here, buy this because I took you to dinner. 
here, buy this because I took you golfing. Here, buy this because I gave money. I took you to this club where we spent $15,000 one night. You know, it's not have to do with that. I mean, people do that, but the real key to sales is solving customer problems. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mag Ian Mag. He's another one of my great students. Yes. This is all you, Andrea. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I um I you know, I was just agreeing, I suppose, first with you. Uh yeah. I mean, I think it I think it um it requires, you know, I think entrusting and delegating to your staff and believing they can do it and believing, you know, you've trained them. They know who you are. They, they, they're going to come to you when they need to and uh, managing the results, right? Managing by results, not the how. Do you really care how they're meeting their job or the what? If you're still getting the good outcomes, I like status reports. I have to admit, I am, I do. <laughs> if I don't get that status report, you can bet I'm going to say something. Getting the status reports, doing the check-ins. But, you know, I used to, you know, I think we've all been, sometime in our career, we've been micromanaged. And, and I'm not at all suggesting that you are. This was just an example uh, for me saying, I, it would drive me crazy if someone was questioning how I did something as opposed to what I did, you know. Why are you asking me how I did this or how I did that? Just ask me what I did. I'll send it to you. If it's no good, fine. But if it's fine, then I don't, why do you even care why I'm doing it that way? So anyways, I, I think it does, it definitely requires a greater level of um, delegation and trust. And if you don't know your team well, it's obviously challenging, but I'm sure that you've been trusted with the responsibility for a reason, so. I'm sure you have it in you. Great perspective, Andrea. I know I've seen a lot more um, in that chat box. Now I'm going to read this out loud because we, we stripped the audio off for other purposes. Hi, Andrea. Have you ever made an error that almost caused the project to fail? And how did you correct it? I was asked this question in an interview. This has been so great. And thanks, Mike, for inviting her. Great. Yeah, that's... That's a great thing I like to relive with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could take this over if you. If you no, no, it's okay. I was joking. I yeah, I I I have made. I would just answer it that yes, I've made mistakes, and I would say big ones that had uh, um, significant impact. Um, I think that if you're asked in an interview <laughs> that question, um, I probably would never provide an answer. There's two, there's two answers, right? I haven't been in a case where it almost cost me the, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's laugh out loud time. But if I was asked that in an interview, I would not say, oh yes, yes, I have many times. How about you? <laughs> right? No, I, I would say I, I've made a mistake. I've made mistakes, but I caught them fortunately in time. Uh, I did a review of my actions. I understood the repercussions. It wasn't clear to me at the time what would occur. And, you know, I have had a project where I questioned, uh, I did believe that we could do more. Let's say, okay, I, I do remember a real life incident where I thought we could do more. And I was sitting face to face with the customer. So you're always feeling. When you're face to face and you're sitting with that customer, you're feeling, oh, I can meet. I, I'm I'm empowered to to meet your need. No need for me to check with others. Okay, that you know, kind of pride. But so I I made some type of commitment, not specific one, but I did make a commitment that you know we're going to look into this. I think we can do better. Well, we couldn't. <laughs> so I got the you know the proverbial slap on the hand or whatever it may be. But then I, I owned it, right? And I came back, I said, you know, I, I was a little overconfident and uh, I thought we could do more and we really can't and explain the situation, but I owned it, right? And I think that's the way I would explain that in an interview, whether it's, I probably may not even use that example, that's a real one for me. But um, 
they're, I don't think an interviewer wants to hear even. They may ask that question, but they do not want to hear that you almost cost the project. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they don't want to hear it. Yeah, just give them an answer where you say, "Oh, not exactly, but I did make this uh, mistake where I let a letter go out without proofreading it." You know, <laughs> I mean, give them a give them something where yes, we're all human; we all make mistakes. Actually, you well put. Give them something. Give them honest, an honest something that's real and not a showstopper. So, if someone says, "What are your weaknesses?" I say, "Say what are your strengths." Be honest. If they say, what are your weaknesses? Do not say I'm lazy. <laughs> Do not say I don't like to work. <laughs> now, give them a real weakness. Everybody that knows me, Andrea knows this about me. Chris knows this about me. I'm not Mr. Organized at all. <laughs> it's never me. I got little notes all over the room, which I don't even know where they're at. I don't, it's, I'm not organized. So when people ask me, what's your weakness? I say, well, organization is a problem of mine. But I work hard to mitigate it by a checklist, by a note. But yes. You know, so give them real. Don't lie to people. People can feel when you're lying. And it makes yeah, them give, uh, I mean, from my favorite movie, Hitch, <laughs> so, it's a Will Smith movie. But anyways, he says on a date, he's like, he's like, the, he's giving them advice on how to date women. And so the guy is like, so are you saying lie? And he said, no, I'm saying tell the truth. Be you, but don't be fully you. <laughs> give them a little. There's not too much, right? You don't want to open up. Well, to be on, you know, you don't want to open up your most painful memories. Just give them a little bit of you. Let them know you're authentic. Move on. <laughs> okay, from Delroy Bat. Wow, Delroy, this is a great question. Has there ever been a point in your career where you were completely blindsided with a new challenge and a product with a hard deadline? How did you organize your resources? So I've got answers here. Um, I'll go first, and then I'm going to have Andrea do this. Answer that second. Delroy, in my career, and even from the days that worked with Andrea, I would be, get sent on to projects that no one ever did before in the entire world. So there was no place to look it up. There was nobody you could ask. It was go figure it out along the fly. So constantly blindsided, at least in my world, what I do personally is I take a step back when I get blindsided, what happens all the time. I typically use some kind of something called box breathing, which is a breathing technique that's used by Navy SEALs. It's also called pranayama, it comes from India. Or I do a little bit of yoga. And I'm done a yoga or a little meditation or whatever it takes to clear my mind. A martini would probably work too, but that would dull my intelligence. Um, so I go back and I relax and I come back and I'm like, okay, what is the problem? Okay, wait. There's a compute piece here. There's a network piece here. There's a steward piece here. Okay, now, what are they really asking about X thing? What are they really answering about Y thing? What are they answering about Z thing? Okay, do some more yoga. <laughs> now, go back and ask the next 10 smartest people that I know, how does this work? How does this work? How does this work? How can you do it? And then I come back and then I develop it that way. That's the way I've dealt it through my career because it's been a long time, like two decades, since I actually was able to give things, but that I was given things that people actually did before. So my life has always been like, you know, a stressful figure it out as you along the way. I know Andrea can tell you that from the project she sent me on 20 years ago. Yes. Yeah, for sure. But how about you, Andrea? I'm sure you get projects that you're not prepared for all the time. Yes. Can you put the question back by chance? I just want to make sure I'm answering the exact question. It's from Delroy Bat. Really good young man. He learned my interview tactics, had five job offers within a couple of weeks. You're completely blindsided with a new challenge on a project. Okay. Uh, again, one of those ones kind of like, have you ever had a conflict <laughs> within you? <laughs> so, yes. Uh, for me, I think more, you know, project or customer account basis. So, yes, we're working on a, a very, very large multi million dollar program. And you know, all of a sudden identifying, we're on a tight time frame already, all of a sudden we uh, are made aware of a quality control item, quality control issue. This is not at Versa Networks. It's earlier in my career. And it was, you know, the premier account of the company at the time of where I was. And it was, you know, being first year on this project that gives you a lot of visibility. You're very excited. You know, you're working on this and then you're usually with that comes a lot of, you know, 
uh, challenges. So yes, um, blindsided with, okay, I'm barely making the, the schedule as it is. And now you've given me, now I just found out no one sold the customer. So they're telling you first, right? We have this quality control issue and all these things are gonna you know, need to be replaced. So I think then as part of, I, I don't do everything that Mike does, although it would probably help me, but definitely the take a moment, you know, before you react, before don't react, you want to respond, right? You want to not react, but respond and gather yourself, get an internal meeting together because, you know, at this time you're going to need more heads, more thoughts than just your own, right? So, but you've kind of got to, in my mind, and sometimes you're the either the figure leader or you're the actual leader of the project. You're going to have to actually come. You can't be an open book. Like here's here's the problem. I don't know what to do. You know, you need to be able to be prepared with. Here's the problem. We do need to tell the customer. You need to have some initial thoughts formed already. Like because people will say, well, let's you know, you know, kind of kill off the the easy ones, the low hanging fruit. We are going to have to tell the customer. We are going to have to adjust our schedule. You know, get get the bad news out of the way. We're not going to meet our initial deadline. Now, life is, that happens. How do we handle it? And even actually when I was, um, and I found that when you do that and you're direct and honest with your customers, that they are usually much more willing to work along with you because they've worked with 18,000 vendors and no vendor has pulled off a project, you know, very few with no problems and no challenges, but it's the rare one, just as Mike told earlier about his um, dealings at the Dubai airport who are honest and who can deal with it. And I found that some of the best and the strongest customer relationships that I found are when we had really huge challenges, just that, um, that really derailed the project, the, the goals and where I just told them, you know, not, easily, but, you know, express the understanding. I under, you know, the key is to understand, to make, don't make it seem it's all about you, right? It's not all about you. It's about their project and their business. So when you're communicating those type of issues, say, I know the impact this problem has upon your business. I know we committed to this and I know this is going to affect your revenue. And we were very regretful of that. And that's where the authenticity comes, care about what that problem is going to have on their business. Communicate in that way. It's the only thing you can do, right? You cannot change reality. If there's a, if there's a uh, complete, um, you know, obstacle there, it's an obstacle and it doesn't matter who says it, but it doesn't matter how it's said. And you can control that, how it's said, why it's said, and then the follow through on what you're going to do. And I found that those are some of the best relationships you'll have. They're going to trust you. As Mike said, those relationships will outlast any company, any role that you have, because they're going to remember how you dealt with them. That's it. They're going to remember how you dealt with them. When I worked with Andrea, there was some multicast code that we struggled with. We worked together every day. We worked together in ways trying to solve customer problems. People that I didn't know that got there before I was in the company, sold projects. And Andrew worked with me every day to get them fixed. And you know, after you fix the one customer, they tell the next customer, wow, you should see these people, they came in, they care. And then the next customer and the next yes. customer. Yes. I told one customer in healthcare, uh, an account manager and his engineer had proposed this nurse call system to a hospital. And basically they were gonna give the nurse a portable phone and they were going to integrate the nurse call into this portable phone. And I'm in a meeting with the chief executive officer, major healthcare system, the chief nursing officer, the chief medical informatics officer. And the CEO says, Mike, you're a nurse practitioner. What do you think of this solution? And I said, well, the phone would be very helpful in nurses calling doctors. I love that. But the nurse practitioner already knows, the nurse already knows that they can't get the orange juice their patient wants. I said, if you now put this information on a portable phone and you're now paging, paging, paging the nurse, you're going to make them miserable. So be authentic. I told the customer, no. You know what happened a month later? The customer, well, the customer said, just design what we need and we'll come back to you and we'll buy it. I don't need it. I don't need the sales reps. I don't need this complex. I don't need all this back and forth. Tell me what I need, Mike. 
and you come back to me with something. That's what I did. It was that level of authenticity. So I know that Andrea is actually still at work. I know she's actually on the West Coast. Um, <laughs> in Mag, I'm going to close it here. It's all about creating good relationships with people and making sure we don't leave a bad impact. I will actually ask the one answer the one last question. Do we have to have coding skills to be a solutions architect? No. Architects do not program. Architects do not configure. Architects design. So if you want to be an Azure solutions architect, learn end-to-end -end system design, learn the network and the data center, learn to do ROI modeling, learn how to deliver excellent presentations, develop excellent communication skills, Make sure you develop a strong degree of executive presence. Work on that emotional intelligence. And there you go. They're the skills for an architect. So hope I answered your question there. I couldn't read your name because it was in Cyrillic, um, but I hope I was able to answer your question. Jeannie, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeannie. Jeannie. A student of mine. Jeannie knows I love Ethiopian food so much that she sent me two hard to find spices from Ethiopia, um, wow. Spiro as well as Burberry, something that I can't even find locally since my wow. local Ethiopian restaurant is closed right now because Good of COVID. people are still on. That's so nice. <laughs> they sure are. Um, Lonzo, ah. always appreciate every kind thing you have to say. He's good. Thank you, Lonzo. <laughs> Ahmad, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Yavar. I'm sorry I couldn't get your. I didn't. I couldn't read your name. If it was in Greek, I could read oh, it. But, uh. nice. <laughs> Morithi over oh. there in England. Thank you so much. Oh, it's late. We actually have Andrea. We actually have people like Chin and others that are actually in Asia that stayed to hear you speak. I've got people Ooh. in Singapore that stayed to hear you speak. People in India are here to see you speak. I don't think it's me, but thank you. <laughs> it is. Ian uh, is my good friend in England. He's now a cloud architect. Yay. He's also in the military. Need to learn PMP. <laughs> um, no, you don't need to learn that as an architect. Um, but you know, we do occasionally manage projects or lead projects. So I wanted you to all be experienced to a rock solid world class program manager. Thanks, Jason. All right, it's always good to speak to you. <laughs> Cloud Jay, thanks so much. Cloud Jay, I talked to <laughs> I answered their question. Oh, that's really nice. Thanks so much. Uh, Ian, when you come to Florida, we're going to have some red striped beer, and I will cook some jerk chicken and peas and rice. I'll even eat grains that day, and I'll make some bammy as well. Chin is over there in Asia. Isaac, thank you so much. What time is it in Asia? It must be middle of the night. Wow, yeah. Actually, it was the middle okay. of the night when my Asian students were in the last call. Adam, he oh, stayed up wow. to Sam. Oh my Adam's God. one of my motivated youngsters that's going to get out of school and be everything that everybody needs. Chidi, Jane, I am so happy to see you. You were here. Chidi, I wonder if he watched the um, that sitcom and the guy's name was Chidi. Yeah, the good place. Anyway. Oh, I actually love that show, but Jane. Yeah, Jane, his you know, name is Chidi. Sure. Derek is a real class act. He's one of my students, and I say the word. I'm Yun Mag. Uh, thank you so much. You didn't need coffee to stay up. <laughs> Mag is over in India. Angela. Uh, Angela is, well, Angela was one of my first students. She's now a cloud architect. I know. I have nothing but great things. Um, 2 a.m. Oh, my goodness. Oh, he started from 2 a.m. Whoa. Okay. Well, Andrew, well, this has been great. Thank you so much, Mike. And it's so great to have an international audience. It's very cool. Thanks so much for joining us, Andrea. I'm super grateful. Obviously, you'll hear from me soon. One day, I'm going to steal you and bring you on to Go Cloud Careers. Um, although all the people in your company will hate me for doing it. So, you know, I expect to have, you know, Marines uh, coming to my house, you know, angry at me for this. But one day, some way, somehow, I'm going to have to get their permission to steal you. But in the meantime, I think you're at a great, great, great technology company. One that I would work with with you. I like so much. Those people are so great. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Oh, I, I think you're talking to you. 
one of the best technology companies that's more innovative yes. than some of the best people. I miss yes. the people you work with so badly that just because I said I'd like to steal you, I know oh. they need you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, dad's here. <laughs> Andrew's got to okay, get that is like some operating to officer to Chris. Um, he's here to make sure that we do things on time because Chris knows I will babble until tomorrow because I've got yeah. my good friend Andrew that I have the biggest respect for in the world. I'm super excited to hear you and I love to teach. So yeah. Chris, thank you for taking over. Thank you for getting Andrea back to the meetings that she's late for. Andrea, thank <laughs> you, you so much. Could you see my note, Chris? I got your note. That's why I popped in. I said, oh, okay. there's a message over here. Andrea's got wow. a meeting to go to. <laughs> I'm like, I'm seeing, I'm like, I've already missed one meeting. So, but it was, this was really great. It was really cool. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Andrea. Take care, everyone. It's been a real honor and a privilege um, to spend the afternoon with you. Andrea, I can't thank you enough. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. I'll let you know, you know how to close it in all the right ways, Chris. Is there any last minute questions for me? Because I've, I've got a couple more minutes. Uh, nothing that uh, nothing that's popped in. I think they I think I scared everybody away. <laughs> okay, well, if everybody's scared away, everybody's scared away. I hope everyone here had a great time. Andrew is one of the many experts in the field coming from different perspectives. I know of no better program manager anywhere in the world, and that's why I brought her to you. I'm going to bring in some network experts. I'm going to bring in some more security experts. I'm a network guy myself, but you know, I want you to hear from others in industry. So you can hear, it's not just me saying that architects don't code, for example, or you can hear it from me when hearing what architects do at other companies, hearing how to lead great organizations. I'll have to do this. Um, I think that sounds fun. Um, I've got something with your name on it waiting for you, Alonzo, when you get to Florida. You don't need to bring anything. Um, greetings as well. Um, to, so, Bring your book. Yeah, bringing a book is probably a really good idea. Okay, everyone, if there's no last minute questions, I'll have Chris end this. Again, I'm so happy and excited to see you. I hope you all had a great time today. And let me know if you've enjoyed this by typing cloud architect in the chat box. Of course, you, half of you guys are probably sleepy. It's pretty late where you're at. And there's also a pretty extensive delay. Cloud J, great. Have a good evening, Alonzo. Cloud Architect, Alonzo. Awesome, Rajesh. Jason? Chris, Derek, Isaac, Angela, Ian, Amrath, good to see you. Jeannie, always good to see you. Jen Lim, wonderful, thank you for attending. Jalal, so wonderful to have you here. Dell, always great to see you. Jane Chidi, wonderful to see you. Tintin, always great to see you. And Jesse, you amaze me with your energy and enthusiasm for your age. Great to see you, as does uh, Mr. Say. Honor, I didn't, um, I don't want to mess up your name. I know where it's from, um, but, uh, and it's a wonderful name, but uh, I don't want to miss that up. But thank you so much to see you here. Thank you all, everyone. Take care.